I have not a lot of questions, but not a lot of time. So I'll, I'll get straight to it. I just want to uh, come back to His Excellency uh, President Kagame about uh, the historical significance of what is about to happen. If you look around the world, we see increased protectionism. We see Brexit happening in Europe. Uh, we see trade deals being torn up or revised in uh, the Americas. But here you see African co countries moving in their own direction, in their, charting their own path, liberalizing trade amongst themselves. How significant is that? And what, how does it fit in with the historical aspirations of integration for this great continent? Thank you, moderator, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, uh, Africa has been lagging behind on many fronts, including on that uh, process of integration. And uh, on this particular, in this particular case, the uh, free trade that we are going to uh, usher in uh, when we have concluded uh, this agreement among the African states. And as you've rightly mentioned, those who have been ahead of us, ahead of Africa, and actually doing the right thing, uh, seem to be having difficulties with the, the right thing they were doing. While we were lagging behind, they were ahead, now they are having difficulties. I'm not saying that uh, on our part, on the part of Africa, that this is a business, uh, that, that this is going to be a benefit of having lagged behind, but uh, I think we are on the right path and uh, even those who are uh, leaving exactly the right thing they were doing and where we are headed will in the end come back to it and want to do that right thing again. So they will find us in the right place by the time we conclude this uh, agreement. So continental free trade area and integration are more or less one and the same. They really complement each other in a very fundamental way because it brings the people of Africa, the leaders, the private sector together in realizing the actual benefits of trading with each other, doing business together, working together that strengthens all other aspects of even social integration that actually is also going to be beneficial to the whole continent. So I, I, even as I said earlier, with all the difficulties people find in meeting certain conditions or obligations, I think it's a question of how fast we are moving and we should be moving as fast as possible, but I think the direction is the right one that we have taken, and we should continue in the same. Thank you, Your Excellency, thank you. I will now turn uh, to uh, your fellow president who has been called the um, champion of the AFCFTA process for good measure. He's worked, and his team, have worked tirelessly to reach uh, this historic moment that we now find ourselves in. Now, President Kagame, in your speech you said there's still lots of more work to do. It's not complete, it's not done yet, there's still lot, lots more work. So, um, uh, pre pre President Tisufu, um, I, I want to ask you, what are the next steps in the process for the establishment of the AFCFTA? What happens after this? Bien, je vous remercie. Je voudrais d'abord euh, remercier mon frère euh, Paul Kagame pour euh, l'hospitalité qui nous est offerte ici au Rwanda pour euh, ce forum et puis pour euh, le lancement demain de la zone euh, de libre échange continental africaine. Demain, nous allons 
en principe signé quatre documents. Le premier document, c'est l'accord cadre portant donc zone de libre échange continentale. Il y a un deuxième document qui est le protocole sur le commerce des marchandises, un troisième document qui porte sur le commerce de services et enfin un protocole sur le règlement des différents. Une fois que cela aura été signé, l'étape suivante, c'est la ratification de ces, de ces documents. Euh, une fois que le minimum requis de ratification est obtenu, euh, en principe, l'accord ou les accords vont euh, entrer en vigueur. Mais, mais demain, nous allons discuter justement du nombre minimum de ratification qui puisse permettre l'entrée en vigueur euh, donc, euh, de, ces différents, de ces différents accords. Mais également, la réflexion n'est pas terminée parce que ces accords ont des annexes, ont des appendices sur lesquels il va falloir continuer à travailler, sur lesquels il faut réfléchir et les programmer une réunion des négociateurs au mois de mai pour finaliser ce travail qui sera certainement présenté au prochain sommet ordinaire de l'Union africaine qui va se dérouler à Nouakchott au mois de juillet prochain. Ensuite, nous avons également à mettre en place un secrétariat qui, est, qui sera chargé euh, du suivi de la mise en œuvre de la zone de libre échange euh, continental. Ça, c'est, je dirais, la première phase. Nous avons une deuxième phase qui va être engagée, une deuxième phase de négociation qui va porter sur les négociations par rapport au, au protocole sur les investissements par rapport au protocole aussi sur la concurrence et par rapport euh, au protocole euh, sur euh, la propriété, je crois, euh, intellectuelle, le droit de propriété intellectuelle. C'est des aspects extrêmement importants qui ne vont pas être laissés de côté et qui feront l'objet également de, de négociations. Voilà donc euh, quelques étapes euh, qui sont devant nous. Mais il y a un aspect extrêmement important qui a été souligné d'ailleurs par le président Paul Kagame, c'est l'aspect campagne de sensibilisation. Parce que l'intégration ne doit pas se faire seulement par le haut. Il faut qu'elle se fasse par le bas. Il faut que les peuples africains s'approprient ce projet d'intégration africaine, ce processus d'intégration. Donc il y a une campagne de sensibilisation qu'il va falloir mener dans tous les pays membres de l'Union africaine afin de sensibiliser les populations, afin de sensibiliser les citoyens afin que les citoyens s'approprient euh, ce projet. Et je pense que le présent forum est un début d'ailleurs, marque un début pour la sensibilisation des opérateurs économiques qui sont ici euh, présents et qui sont peut-être les premiers bénéficiaires de ce projet de zone de libre-échange continental. Merci. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, I will follow on. I will follow on from what you said about sensitizing the stakeholder groups and turn uh, to His Excellency, the Chairperson of the African Union Commission, uh, Commission Moussa Faki Mahamat. Uh, and and uh, it's sort of a two-part um, question, really. Uh, the first is, what are the guarantees that we will move from mere signature tomorrow to real implementation of this historic agreement? Uh, the next question is, with reference to sensitizing different stakeholder groups, what is the most important question, uh, most important message, should I say, to the private sector? Because, as we heard earlier, this is not possible without them. Uh, merci. Je voudrais d'abord uh, remercier les participants d'avoir répondu favorablement à notre invitation. Remercier également le Rwanda d'avoir accepté d'abriter cet important forum. Le secteur privé, la société civile, le monde universitaire, les personnalités qui sont présentes ici, je crois que c'est pour nous une occasion de vulgariser 
un des projets phares de l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine. C'est le commerce qui a toujours fait la richesse des nations. Et c'est le commerce qui a toujours permis au peuple de se connaître, de se découvrir et d'entretenir les meilleures relations. L'Afrique que nous voulons, c'est une Afrique unie, une Afrique prospère et une Afrique en paix. Il n'y aura jamais de paix, il n'y aura jamais de prospérité ni d'unité sans intégration. Et c'est pour cela que le CFTA est l'un des instruments qui puisse permettre à l'Afrique de se retrouver de par ses intérêts. Nous avons passé 55 ans d'union, d'unité et d'union politique. Mais cela n'est pas suffisant pour que l'Afrique, celle dont nous rêvons, soit une réalité. Il faut un moteur qui puisse tirer cette, cette volonté des peuples. Et je pense que le secteur privé a un rôle clé. Au risque de me répéter, le commerce a toujours été le lien entre les, entre les nations. Et donc, certes, le politique, pour rendre effectif cet accord, doit faire ce que le président champion a dit. Donc il faut signer, il faut ratifier, il faut créer les conditions au niveau national, au niveau régional et au niveau continental. La sécurité juridique et judiciaire. Il faut créer une certaine gouvernance économique et politique. Il faut que l'ensemble du secteur privé, que ce soit les grandes entreprises ou les petites et les moyennes entreprises, puissent en bénéficier. Il faut que les administrations nationales se mettent à l'heure de l'intégration. Les questions fiscales, les questions douanières, il faut avoir toutes ces facilitations et accompagner le processus. Il y a certes, vous l'aurez constaté, nous avons déjà en janvier lancé le marché unique en matière de transport aérien, qui est également l'un des éléments facilitant cette intégration. Nous avons également le protocole, d'ailleurs que nous soumettrons également à la signature des chefs d'État sur la libre circulation des biens. Donc il y a beaucoup de choses à mettre en place et il faut impliquer secteur privé, la société civile et pour que les Africains s'approprient. Le politique fait sa part, qui est importante, mais le plus important, c'est l'appropriation par les bénéficiaires eux-mêmes. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, I, I will move to your left, if you don't mind, because uh, and, and follow on from that issue of what you were asking the private sector, um, almost where, where the private sector should stand right now to support the AFCFTA. Now, um, Strive must see where uh, your, com your company is in 20 countries already. I mean, it truly 20? 29 countries already. Uh, I stand corrected, 29 countries uh, in a whole range of, of areas, including telecommunications, the future, digi the digital space. Um, so this is important to you. You want to see this succeed because you're already there. Um, you've heard uh, the calls from uh, the, His Excellency, the President, um, and also the Chairperson, that they need you. They cannot do this without you. My question turns around, what's the expectations of the private sector? What do you want from African governments to establish the AFCFTA? Well, first of all, thank you and um, my appreciation to His Excellency President Kagame for welcoming us here as the private sector. Um, this is really what we want. We want to work together and to be partners. Um, but in answer to your question with respect to the continental free trade area, we want one market. In a word, we want a single market. Africa has a GDP as a continent of nearly $3 trillion. It's about the size of India. Our population is almost the same. We're 1.2 billion people. But we don't have a market of 1.2 billion people. We don't have a continent, continental GDP of $3 trillion. 
What we have is cantons, little countries. Mm. So when you, when you are trying to trade mm. across our continent, you are not seeing the opportunity of that market size. Mm. So with, and, and this is reflected in the level of intra-trade, as President Kagame said mm. in his speech, less than 17%. Regions like Asia are already hitting 68%. And it's reflected. When you look at our greatest challenge on this, on this continent, it is the creation of jobs yes. for young people. Yes. Even with the growth that we have seen over the last two decades in economies like, our, like the Rwandese economy, which is hitting 7%, mm. we cannot sustain employment creation. Mm. And central to that is to give us, the private sector, the tools. Mm. The tools to expand across our markets, the tools to be able to move people mm. that are working within our businesses, and to be able to move much quicker than we do. Mm. It is extremely difficult. Mm. I speak to investors from within Africa, as well as from beyond. And they tell you, our, economy, our continent is hard to do business in, but for a few uh, countries. It shouldn't be an exception for us to create the kind of employment opportunities for our young people. This is absolutely fundamental. This is not a choice that we are, we are dealing with here. It's not an option. Yeah. We, we can't take it or leave it. It has to be done. It's not a done. leave it, take it or leave it. Mm. So what we want is efficient implementation. We should have a competition, a prize, for the countries that ratify this accord quickest. Mm. Let's call <laughs> it the, the Masiwa Prize. <laughs> okay. Because it will reflect, it, it will be a serious message to the world that Africa is open for business. Mm. Let's ratify this accord. Let us move quickly and execute on it. Thank you. Amen to that. Amen to that. Uh, speaking of, of, of a prize, uh, later on in this program, um, there'll be the launch of uh, something called the CFTA Country Index. This is almost like the enabling a, a business environment, ease of doing business index that the, the, the World Bank releases. And it will indeed measure the progress on many fronts. It comes out of a, um, a division of UNECA called the African Trade Policy Center, and you'll see the launch of that index later on today. In fact, if I, I would advise everybody here to go to UNECA's website and take a look at some of the statistics uh, that Strive uh, was talking about. They're fascinating. Not just the 17% compared to the rest of the world, but in what EFCFTEA can do in numbers. They, it's quite remarkable. And perhaps uh, the most significant research done on intra-Africa trade has been done by UNECA. So I'm going to turn to Vera Songwe right here. Um, what are the most important numbers and uh, I suppose analysis and statistics that our political leaders and business leaders right here should take note of, Vera? Listen, first of all, thank you very much um, to President Kagame, the government of Rwanda, for having us here today, the champion, the Afro champion, President Sufu. I think to the African Union as well and all the work we've been doing together. Just to pick up on what uh, Strive said, and I think there is a slide on what you said, I think it's how will we know? I think tomorrow we will be closing the deal. So we know that for a fact. But the question is, are we ready to continue going on this movement? Are we ready to make sure that we can actually succeed? And what the uh, ECA has done is we have put together an index, and I want the slide to go up if we can, which is basically um, Strive. We didn't plan this, but uh, we have the index for you. Uh, which will basically let us know how quickly and how fast countries are going ahead in terms of ratifying uh, But we, the she agreement. doesn't have the prize yet. So she doesn't have the prize. We, 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 uh, <laughs> the prize will come, I think, more importantly, because you will open your markets. And just to give you some numbers, and I think uh, Strive was talking about that, in 2025, if we do well, and if we make this work, the African market will be $3.6 trillion. 
This is not insignificant for business because at the end of the day, this is why you're here. Of that $3.6 trillion, you will have about $2.4 trillion, which will be business to business. For business to business to work, we are creating supply chains, we are, which means basically that you have to start trading across borders on the continent to build the kinds of African conglomerates that we need to power the continent. Now today, when you look at business to business and how well we're doing, we're not doing so well. Most of our big businesses actually import their inputs from abroad, from out of the continent, because of the time it takes to actually bring in goods onto the continent. So what we're doing with the African Country Business Index is to say, how can we make sure that we hold ourselves to task? How can we ensure that we will actually see this as a reality, hopefully when we ratify the uh, CFTA in a few days? So the first index that we will be measuring is implementation. And you look at regular private, public private consultations. This is one, so we'll take that as, a, as, a, as something that we've done well. The national strategies on how you implement the CFTA. We know that different countries have different procedures. In some countries it's the executive, in some countries it's the parliament, and in some countries it will be a combination of both. But we hope that those consultations will happen soon enough and we can ratify. The second thing, we'll be looking at easing trade in Africa. And it will be basically what kinds of cross-border logistics are needed. Can we break down those barriers? I think His Excellency, the head of state, talked about non-tariff barriers. In actuality, on the continent today, it's not tariffs that kill us. It is non-tariff barriers. It's the things we do not see. It's the impediments to trade that we cannot visibly calculate. Give some so, examples of that for those that don't know what a non-tariff barrier is. For example, you decide that you are going to assess the quality of a good that comes to your country without very clear conditions about what standardization processes you're going to use. And that stops, so you the, create, that stops the flow. That stops the flow immediately. Mm -hmm. So I think these are the kinds of things that we don't quantify that essentially are stopping us. And we hope that with the CFTA, we can actually move forward on these kinds of non-tariff barriers. You have issues about countries regulating imports and exports. You know, in one month, we say you can only export 10%. I see uh, the Vice President of Cote d'Ivoire here with cashews. And uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, work has been done in opening the markets for cashews and keeping it open. Some other countries contract and expand the exports of cashews and the imports of cashews. This means that if you're not in the country that is producing the cashews, but you're processing the cashews, you cannot ensure a good supply of those cashews to continue working. That is a non-tariff barrier because you're not stopping it, but occasionally the countries will block the exports. The third index that we're looking at is what we're going to call trade for development or trade for uh, Africa 2063, the Africa we want, is essentially, next slide, how can we make sure that we are actually trading? And I think when we talk a lot about trade, we look at the numbers, but essentially trade is about production. And that's where the jobs get created, is because we can produce. We need essentially to produce more on the continent. We cannot trade more if we're not producing more. And that's why the whole context of sort of trade for development, trade for agenda 2030, trade for agenda 2063 comes in place. As we produce, we will create more employment by definition. We also know on the continent that the smaller businesses will create the most number of jobs. Mm. But these smaller businesses need to be anchored around big business. This has been the development process across the world. Today on the continent, we have about 700 corporates. If you look at the sector of construction, 76% of the construction sector is Africa-owned. This basically means that in the construction sector, we could create a supply chain that works if we supply regionally, if we supply locally. But we are not doing that. We still import 15% of our cement from abroad. We should not be importing cement from outside the continent today. We make every raw material that you need for cement. Mm -hmm. But when you ask countries, they will say it's faster to get it from Norway. Mm -hmm. Or fertilizer, for example. Mm -hmm. We still import a big share of our fertilizer. We should not be doing that because we can produce internally. And by doing production, for example, of fertilizer, it will be cheaper. The women will have more uh, fertilizers. Output will increase. Productivity will increase. Agribusiness will grow. And I think this is the linkage that we are trying to make here when we sit here today. The SADEC zone, 60% of manufactured goods are sold and traded inside the SADEC zone, mm. only 10% in ECOWAS. Mm. Nothing stops ECOWAS from becoming like SADEC, 
and trading a lot more manufactured goods. I think that we can do that if we can open our borders, and that is the last part that we're looking at, is what is the reduction of all this cost going to do to our trade? Hopefully, the first thing it will do is create more jobs. Because that is essentially what we want, is that we can see more creation in jobs, we can see better governance, and all the other indexes that we monitor will improve by definition if we can have better uh, continental free trade agreements. So today, we are actually witnessing a substantial change in paradigm on the continent if we can make this happen. It's basically saying Africa can produce. If Africa produces, Africa can employ its youth. Africa can employ its young women. And trade is also particularly trade in services. As we break down this barrier of trade, we will have a huge service sector that will open up on logistics, on information technology, on e-platforms, where we believe that even more women will have access to markets that they do not have today. So this for us is, I think that when we look at the numbers, and I hope I've given you enough numbers to show you where we are going and what we can do, it is not impossible. I think with SADC at 60% intra-Africa trade and manufacturing, ECOWAS at 10, maybe the next challenge is to say, can we get ECOWAS to come up to 60% as well? Very, that's very, very, very clear, as I said. Go to the UNECA website, speak to UNECA. I think this is a, a, one point. When we're talking about stakeholders, we're not just talking about a bilateral discussion between uh, your government and your private sector. We're talking about talking to other stakeholders, like UNECA. There, is a, there are areas of collaboration that you've not even thought of, and I hope over the next day, all of you will speak to each other and find ways that you can combine forces and combine knowledge to push through the AFCFTA and make this a reality. The champion of the AFCFTA, I'm coming back to you. Um, we heard from uh, Strive Masiwa, they're ready. Um, there are leaders in business who are ready right now to work with you. Um, my question is, what are some of the incentives from the side of government? What can government do now in order to offer businesses that makes it more attractive to come on board? Because there are those skeptics out there that don't understand what this thing is. They're afraid. There is fear. And fear lives in the unknown. So first, we have to make the CFTA known. But once we do that, what are the, what are the first steps towards forging that stronger relationship with the private sector, Your Excellency. I would like to say that what is going to happen tomorrow is really historic. It is historic in the process of integration of the continent, this continent that has been divided. Ce continent qui a été balkanisé, qui a été donc euh, affaibli. L'Afrique, euh, c'est 84 000 kilomètres de frontières. Et ces frontières sont autant d'obstacles au développement du commerce euh, intra-africain. Cela a été dit qu'il ne représente à peine que 17% de l'ensemble des échanges du, du continent. Et donc, je voudrais insister sur le fait que euh, la zone de libre-échange continental a pour but, a pour objectif de liquider ces obstacles, de liquider les obstacles tarifaires, de liquider les obstacles non tarifaires. Cela a été dit euh, tout, à, euh, tout, tout à l'heure. Et il est certain que cela va avoir euh, des effets immenses sur, euh, sur la croissance euh, économique, parce que c'est ça aussi qui va intéresser Les, les opérateurs économiques avoir euh, une croissance forte euh, sur le continent. Euh, toutes les variables qui forment le PIB vont être influencées par euh, la zone de libre échange continental, que ce soit la consommation, cela a été dit, que ce soit les exportations, que ce soit les investissements, que ce soit les importations, tout cela va être influencé par la mise en place de la zone de libre échange euh, continental. Nous avons Avec cette zone, un marché, cela a été dit, de 1,2 milliard de, de consommateurs. Ça veut dire que la zone de libre-échange continentale va créer des économies d'échelle qui vont permettre une réduction des coûts, qui vont permettre une meilleure compétitivité, donc par conséquent, de nos, de nos entreprises qui pourront mieux produire, qui pourront mieux exporter, cela a été dit, 
et qui pourront mieux satisfaire la consommation intérieure également. Cette consommation qui va être en pleine expansion compte tenu du fait que la classe moyenne est en pleine expansion en Afrique. Il a été, un chiffre a été cité, je crois, tout à l'heure. D'ici 2030, on aura une classe moyenne de 600 millions de consommateurs. Donc, euh, tout cela permettra à, à l'Afrique de, de produire, de satisfaire la demande intérieure et même d'accroître les, les, les exportations. Donc, voilà des opportunités qui sont offertes aux opérateurs économiques. Mais il faut dire aussi que la zone de libre-échange continental n'est pas un projet isolé. C'est un projet qui est cohérent avec d'autres plans et programmes de l'Union africaine, comme par exemple le plan de développement industriel de l'Afrique ou le, 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 plan, le programme pour le développement des infrastructures en Afrique, c'est le programme, je crois, du, du, du NEPAD, comme également le programme détaillé d'accélération du développement de l'agriculture en Afrique, la vision minière euh, africaine, euh, etc. Et cela a été dit tout à l'heure, il y a également ce marché unique du transport aérien qui va être lancé également euh, demain. Et je crois que demain aussi, nous allons pouvoir signer le protocole sur la circulation des personnes, euh, sur euh, le droit d'établissement, sur... Euh, le droit de résidence, tout ça, c'est des opportunités qui sont offertes donc, aux, opérateurs, aux opérateurs économiques. Donc, globalement, je pense que... Et, et puis, il y a le climat des affaires qu'on est en train d'améliorer dans tous nos pays. Et tout cela va concourir, je crois, à booster les activités économiques. C'est des opportunités qui sont offertes aux opérateurs économiques pour faire davantage d'affaires sur le continent. Now, Your Excellency, thank you. You, you, you mentioned exports, uh, and I'm going to turn to His Excellency, the Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Um, if you look at the um, percentage of global trade that Africa does, it's very low. In fact, um, uh, Ms. Songwe, what is it, 3%, 3%, isn't it, of global trade? That has to change. We are, we are 3% is almost negligible. How does the creation of one African market, Your Excellency, strengthen our position on that global trade stage? I think uh, uh, between what uh, bring that microphone, bring that microphone over here. Between what uh, Strive Masiwa said and uh, what Vera said, numbers are clear, the benefits are clear, what needs to be done is clear. So I think we have only ourselves to blame. If we just don't do what we know, we ought only to do. ourselves to blame. <laughs> It increases the volume of everything that we want to, to, to do. We talked about employment, it's about the volume of business, it's the money, it's, I mean, so we, we, we are the kind of uh, horses that are, are very thirsty, <laughs> taken to the well, and some horses decided to drink the water, others have excuses, and they end up dying of thirst. <laughs> I, I think that is, that is what it is. That's a, sim that's a beautiful analogy. Yeah, we, we can't keep having excuses for decades. Mm. Uh, it's not because we lack information. Mm. The data has been put there, we have all seen it. The statements have been made by all of us, very clear to the point. Uh, so that, that's why on one hand it is simple to, to see the answer. I, I don't know why it remains difficult uh, to just go ahead and uh, implement what we are mm. capable of and get the benefits we want. Mm. Uh, so it's no longer the numbers that are not known. It's no longer the uh, problem we face as, mm. as a continent that we 
uh, we don't know. It's, it's, so really it's one get, is short of words uh, as to how to explain uh, in terms of our problem. It seems we, we, enjoy, we enjoy problems. <laughs> 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 yes, so if, if that is the case, then... Uh, <laughs> we should stop enjoying problems, Absolutely. I think. Especially okay. when you have answers. Yes. And uh, one of the answers is, is just what is being discussed here and what mm. the African leaders, the political business leaders, mm. uh, have come to put together and we need to move on. But from your vantage point, your, does it feel like change is happening? Are we at in a new dawn, as some people are calling it? Change is happening. It's, it's only happening slowly. Mm. When we, we are capable of moving faster. Mm. But change is happening. But uh, we can't just talk about change happening without examining the, the, the very factors that actually help us bring about this change uh, and also see what is it that uh, delays us in uh, uh, obtaining the change that we are capable of and that we want. Mm. But change is there. In fact, the fact, the very fact that we are here talking about this, the, the the head of state champion who put all this together and uh, the team of uh, the African Union Commission led by the chairperson, uh, having worked on this and made sure that it is a priority on the agenda of the African Union mm. uh, and, and all the good work that has given us uh, the kind of uh, information that we need, I, I think shows that uh, some level of uh, sense of urgency is, is coming in, and, and we just need to seize the moment and uh, not to waste time. Amen to that. Um, His Excellency, the President of Niger, uh, and also Vera uh, um, and Strive all said one important word. It, it, it wasn't trade, it was jobs. The word jobs. The fa and I see the AFCFTA as a job a, a creator, effectively, which is what we really need. Strive, you are particularly, your company is a telecommunications company, so you are at the cutting edge of the fourth industrial revolution, they're calling it, and we'll have a session later on just about that, so please catch that session. We have a lot of young and fantastic people. We're the youngest continent in the world. Uh, the way people are working is changing. Jobs are no longer jobs. It's can you add value? You can be sitting in your bedroom and be working somewhere right across the world. Uh, with this brave new world we see with technology, how can we use one market uh, to capitalize on that and create jobs for our youth? We, we create jobs through entrepreneurship. We have to nurture, we have to first of all recognize Africa's entrepreneurs. From the informal sector women to young people working, creating new businesses every single day on this continent. We have to recognize them, nurture them, support them. You know, there's another statistic on the other end that I'd like to throw at you. By the turn of the century, our population could hit 4 billion. We could be 40% by some projections of the global population. What we do today decides the legacy we set for that generation. That, that is the urgency that we have. Peace, security, everything else that we try to build is on the nexus of the opportunities we create for the young. This is a young continent, average age 19. And yet we have this fourth industrial revolution on our doorstep, mm. uh, where it will be extremely difficult to create jobs the way we've understood them. Let me tell you, uh, if you're thinking of industrial manufacturing, go and have a look at what it's going to look like. 
And you are, we are not going to be able to do it without building the kind of tools that our leaders are trying to put together here. The type of platforms. The ta like the this AFC kind of FTA. platform. So I, I want to come back again to say, I think for me, the most important thing for the leaders that are gathered here that I urge you is you've got to believe that this is a necessity. Because if you don't believe this is a necessity, you can't articulate it to your own people. Because we have to go back and we have to explain to our people why this is necessary, why it is good. Because it also has costs, some of which will be in the immediate term. Mm. But when we all know what it is we're trying to do, it's like our battle for decolonization. Mm. It was costly. But we understood where we wanted to get to. The union of Africa is where we want to get to the prosperity of our people. So it calls for us to go back and articulate to our people because there will be pushback. When they start seeing movements of people and they say, where are these people coming from? Why do we have Nigerians here? Why do we have Senegalese here? They've got to understand it in the context mm. of the greater good for our continent. Mm -hmm. The benefits have to be articulated early. They've got to be, we've got to go mm. and we go. As we believe, mm. we must become evangelists of what we believe. Yes, evangelists. Mm. And we've got to articulate it so that our people come with us. It's got to go beyond just talking to ourselves as leaders. Mm. We've got to bring in civil society. We've got to bring in our people's representatives in parliaments and so forth. Because otherwise, you just need a populist fire. Mm. And the next thing someone is calling for is reversal. Mm. Or someone says, we know our industries are going to be destroyed. There are provisions in this agreement mm. that cover for all that. So there is nothing to fear. So we have to be able to articulate the benefits of this so that those voices don't pull us back. And Thank one you. of the voices, one of the uh, evangelistic uh, organizations is the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, as it's well known. And we are lucky enough to have Mukisa Kituyi here in the audience. Uh, and I'd like him just to grab a mic. Uh, the young man, give, uh, if you could stand up, please, sir, um, for, to give us a quick intervention, because we heard you earlier in the uh, Afro Champions uh, uh, breakfast. Please, take the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Um, all great things have been said here. Just a little I want to add is that the global environment in which we launch this ambitious African baby is a hostile environment. The rising protectionism, the major threats to rules-based multilateral trading system. Why don't we just take those two in a little way? The people who are angry with globalization are not only in the industrialized north where people are losing jobs. There's a lot of people who are angry about trade in Africa, just they don't have voices. And I think as we create voices for them, we better address their concerns before they become politically too angry. Yeah. And secondly, if you are committed to a genuine African integration, you must turn your backs to priorities to non-African initiatives. How do I mean? You cannot successfully sustain the momentum of African integration while you are also going on a retail market negotiating free trade agreements bilaterally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the collective commitment has to say, let us give our priority to the African initiative. Two, when you have been shattering myths like uh, President Gagame, Money to shatter the myth, the fear of free movement of persons. And all of a sudden, you had an African country where Africans were not on the longest queue getting in. Mm. Usually, mm. we are when we go to Europe, yeah. but not in Rwanda. And what has happened? You discover actually nothing bad happens. Let more scale up this that the phenomenon of freeing movement of African services is a plus to Africa. Three, <coughs> I think this is very important. There are political statements of solidarity which are not matched by concrete action. 
I had the privilege to be a trade minister and negotiate regional integration before. Hmm. And one of the main problems we found is government officers at borders pretending they don't know right, the rules. They will just tell you, we don't know that you are allowed to bring this in. Hmm. And they stop your truck at the border for three weeks pretending they don't know. So argumentum ad ignorantium is an excuse to slow down African integration. And what is the solution? What's the quick solution to the that? The quick solution, number one, is political will. Mm. Number two is documenting and shaming mm. the bad examples of not walking the talk. Mm. And number three, we have to be all ready to say one thing very importantly, that we don't have all the solutions but there has to be a new mindset in the relationship between governments and business. That business is not the cash cow to aid, get political money. And for business, that what you buy on the wholesale market collectively is cheaper, is more long run. Long run. But also a challenge to African business. If African business creates condition at home to invest their surpluses in Africa, instead of buying real estate in Leicester and keeping money in money <laughs> options. We'll get more reassuring of African money coming back home than FDI flows from the rest of the world. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic intervention there. A lot of food for thought. Um, the word behind me is business. That's the biggest word there, business. So I'm going to turn to one of um, my country, Nigeria's biggest businessmen. And I'm I hope I don't catch you out, Tonye Cole. Um, if you could give Tonye Cole, who is one of our, our leading uh, lights in, in the indigenous oil and gas sector in Nigeria. In fact, he was uh, the businessman that took the African delegation to Davos this year, if I'm not mistaken. So I know I always call you Mr. Pan-African. So I want you to just come in. From what you've heard here, what, what, what are your thoughts? Thank you very much, Mr. President, for having us. First of all, one of the things that I'm seeing clearly is that business and politics are finally coming together. And this is something that is extremely important. For a long time, business has not been seen as playing an important role in Africa. This is changing, and it must change. We've talked about the political will to make this happen. There's absolutely no way that Africa can achieve what it needs to do if business is not in the room. The second thing that must happen is that businesses have to be at the table when these negotiations are happening because we actually know what is happening across board. We're the ones that see where the difficulties are, we're the ones that know where the hurdles are, we're the ones that see what needs to be removed, we're the ones that see and we are at the forefront of the battle lines where uh, trade is involved. And so in drafting and putting all of this together, it's extremely important that it's not done, business is not called into the room after the fact, but it's called right at the beginning and we have to work hand in hand in making this happen. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tonye. Tonye Cole, who's the founder of Sahara Energy uh, in Nigeria. Um, we heard two very interesting, um, as well, ah, of course, his Excellency Olusha Gunobasanjo, the former president uh, of Nigeria, please, you have the floor, Your Excellency. I, I want to congratulate the three presidents that are here. President Kagame, President Yusuf, and um, President of uh, um, um, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, I want to give you double congratulation. Congratulations for the way you carry out the transition in your country. say more than that. <laughs> but you have told the world that your country is moving on. Please keep the country moving on. That's very important for all of us. 
And of course, I want to congratulate you for your being here. I want to also congratulate the Vice President of Cote d'Ivoire. We've had a lot this morning. And we're now having confluence of the public sector, our political leaders, and the private sector, our barons uh, uh, in the private sector. But we have one thing that is still giving me concern. And it is, we talk of political will, and that political will is not generally there. And it is not there, and please forgive me what I will say, it's not there because most of our leaders are not as knowledgeable as they should be. And don't let us deceive ourselves. They just don't know enough. And one of the things that you, President Kagame, and President Yusuf, <laughs> we have to try and do is get our political leaders sufficiently educated <laughs> to be able, no, 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 I'm not talking of education in going to school. <laughs> I'm talking of education on these matters that are important mm. so that we can get what, what I will call um, a critical mass of hands, heads, and minds of political leadership and private uh, sector leadership to move us forward. Now, I am surprised that any African leader at this point in time will be talking about either not understanding this as very important to be here or to support what you are going to sign tomorrow. I see that as criminal to a fault. With all due respect, I see it as criminal to a fault. President Kagami, don't laugh. <laughs> now, you, well, what it means is that you have work to do. And you are now the chair of AU for this year. And now, if this year passes without this being where it should be, we will have missed a wonderful opportunity. And God forbid that. Yes. Secondly, there are a number of things that you go along with this if it will work, and it will work expeditiously. Um, infrastructure is one thing. We cannot talk of trade without communication, without transportation, without uh, energy. Now, how do we bring this up? so that as we are signing this important uh, trade agreement tomorrow, I will finish now. As we are signing it tomorrow, we are also making sure that those complementary uh, efforts that we go along with it in the area of infrastructure and uh, both soft and hard infrastructure also go along with it. Thank you. Thank you. Eshe Gidigan. Eshe Gidigan, sir. If you uh, would permit me, I will, um, we're almost out of time, so I want uh, the last word, if you permit me, to come from the chairperson of the African Union Commission, Musa Faki Mahamat. Now, we heard three excellent interventions. There's a lot of food for thought there. I just want your last thoughts based on that. Je crois que le lancement du CFTA, du marché unique en transport aérien, 
la libre circulation des personnes sont un test grandeur nature pour l'Afrique, un test à la dimension du continent. Je crois que le leadership africain est interpellé. Les forces vives africaines sont interpellées. Le secteur privé, la société civile, les syndicats, les jeunes et les femmes, l'ensemble des forces vives du continent sont interpellées. On ne peut pas, on ne doit pas rater ces départs. Après près de 60 ans d'indépendance, aujourd'hui, nous sommes 1,2 milliard d'habitants. C'est un marché énorme. Les études sont là, les stratégies sont là, les programmes sont là. Au niveau de l'Union africaine, nous avons des tonnes et des tonnes de dossiers qui sont prêts. Ce qui a fait défaut toujours, c'est la mise en application. Je crois que pour un projet aussi important, dont tout le monde reconnaît, comme l'a dit le président Kagame, on n'a aucune excuse. On n'a aucune excuse et les Africains, la jeunesse africaine a le droit au moins qu'on lui donne cette chance. Il est bien vrai que ce n'est pas l'adoption du CFTA qui va changer du jour au lendemain leur quotidien, mais c'est la voie qui puisse permettre de briser les frontières et d'ouvrir les énergies pour que ce continent-là puisse bénéficier de ses propres ressources et compter. Et c'est ça le sens et l'essence de l'agenda 2063. Now, Your Excellencies, I started this panel with uh, a quote from uh, President Kagame on, and I'll end it with a quote that we heard just minutes ago at that very podium. You said, let's raise our ambitions higher. We can achieve great things together. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the opening panel. Please rise and acknowledge.